<laughs> what I like most about Demio, which is this webinar um, system that you can host different webinars on and like record them is right when it's ready to start uh, recording, it actually asks you to go on stage. So this is what this is, is like going on stage, which means like, do you want to share your microphone and your camera? And what I love a lot about it is that it does like a five, four, three, two, one. And as it's doing that, it's like, all right, let's get started. And then it does like a double hand emoji. It just makes me really happy because it's like hyping you up. <laughs> Okay, so to anybody who is joining or will be watching this replay later, um, welcome to your first Lightroom editing happy hour with uh, Chasing Sunsets. I'm Brittany and my husband's name is Alex. He'll be moderating the chat, but I'll mostly be doing the editing and just chatting through some of the best practices that we use in Lightroom Classic. Um, we are wedding photographers and we really love to document any kind of love story. So we specialize in couples photography, engagements, and today you guys are in for a treat. The gallery that I'll be dipping my toes into is from Cave Creek, Arizona. So very unique greens, very beautiful landscape. But what's really special about this gallery is it comes from a content day that I was lucky enough to attend last year. And it was one of those content days where I loved the elopement and I loved the couple session too, but the elopement was really what booked me on that, that mood board. And um, so I posted those photos. I think we announced like our website launch or something with those photos. And then I completely tucked away the raw folder of the casual couple session for the whole year. And um, it was always on my mind. It was always on like the latter part of any list of to do's. And I was like, one day I'll get to that. So um, after talking with a friend whose name is Caitlin, she put together this really good informational live video where she basically explained like, hey guys, you attend these live events, these content days, because you want to build portfolio and put that portfolio in front of your key audience. So if you never edit the photos, like they never do you never get the value in actually going to the content day. So it inspired me to finally go through that and cull it. And I overshot it because why not? And now I get to edit them with you guys. So I think that's really special. I picked out just a couple of my favorites right away. And those are those will be the photos that we work through today in Lightroom. But uh, yeah, so a little bit of context of where that session came from. We're not in Arizona right now. We're lucky enough to be at home in uh, the Midwest. Alex and I are both from Michigan and Wisconsin. But yeah, so a um, couple of fun things. If you are just joining or if you have signed up and registered and are excited about the replay, what you can expect from this time is just really my start to finish, how do I edit a photo? Um, I'll talk about some of my favorite presets. I'll talk about how I make adjustments to the presets that I might have purchased to make the edit really my own. Um, I'll talk about best practices with presets. Um, and then I'll really walk through inside of Lightroom, what are all of my major and minor adjustments? So that way I can put my seal of approval on an edit and then put it out there to the world to, for the world to see. So if you're interested in how I edit or if you're looking for best practices in Lightroom that you maybe don't know about yet and you're just curious, this will be a great happy hour. And of course, in the chat box on the right hand side, you're more than welcome to add any questions along the way. Or you can maybe pop up and say like, hey, what was that one more time if I do go too fast? Or maybe you just want a refresher on something that we covered. But we will try to keep it to an hour because I want to make sure that we keep these uh, snazzy and, and fast and just something that we can do on a regular basis. So people of, of all different seasons of business can kind of pop in, maybe learn something valuable and then take that and put it into practice in their own editing. So that's my intention. If you guys have any questions, I'm always down to answer. Um, but yeah. So we'll give maybe like two more minutes for anybody who would like to join us live and then we'll dive right in. So maybe for a fun moment in the chat box, just to kick it off while we wait for a few friends, I would love for everyone to tell me where they're logging in from. So I'm currently coming at you, I'm coming at you live from Hartford, Wisconsin. 
Alex and I are lucky enough to have an office space here, so that's a lot of fun. We get to sit down and work on our computers outside of the van, which is really nice. Um, so where is everybody else coming in from? And um, yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> okay, so so far, cool, we got Abby. Hi, Abby. A lot of people, of course, can't join live, but we always do replays for any of these events. So if you love this kind of content, but it just doesn't always fit in with your schedule, make sure to always register whenever we announce a new event. Um, we have such an easy way of sending out replays to anyone who registers, so make sure to register. All right, one more minute. I can start sharing my screen so you guys can see what I'm working on. Okay. And like I said, Alex will be moderating the chat. So if I miss your question right away, just wait a few moments because he's letting Nick out and then he'll be right back in. But today we are working on Lightroom. So I'm just going to open up Lightroom Classic. And I can start from the top just talking about why I recommend Lightroom Classic versus um, just Lightroom on the, on the desktop. Lightroom Classic has more functionality inside of it that will allow you to do more things with your photos. Um, there's just so much available and there's new updates all the time. The most recent one of the masking feature, which we'll talk about today, that's really changed the game for our, our edits. Um, inside of that masking feature, you have the very unique opportunity to select either a subject or the sky, and you can specifically manipulate the colors, the highlights, all of the things inside of one of those elements, which is really cool because a lot of times a preset's like the whole dang picture, and if you adjust something in the whole picture, it's not one size fits all. Skin tone is a lot different than the colors in the sky. So the masking feature has been a really cool thing and that's only available in Lightroom Classic. So here's Alex and Nick. Yay, thanks Alex. And he'll be moderating the chat, but otherwise, um, if you continue to watch the screen recording, I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about Lightroom and, and what I do to edit. So I picked out 12 photos and I started to kind of futz around with them just so I could kind of have a base for where I want to go with this, but I will be starting from the very top and working my way down. So uh, the last webinar we did, we talked about culling and how important that is, because if you cull inside of Lightroom Classic or even Lightroom Desktop, you'll find that it's a lot harder to, to get down to your final photos as fast as possible. Um, the program just takes a lot longer to process each photo, even just to simply pull it up so you can take a look at it. So um, the one part of the process I'm not showing today is that culling. We went through these photos, I went through these photos in Photo Mechanic, and I picked out 12 for today that I thought would be really fun to play with, and then I imported them over into Lightroom. So if that's part of the step that you are super lost on, let me know and we can always go back, but otherwise that's pretty much the, the foundation of where we'll begin today. And I can always reset um, any of these photos too, so you, you can see exactly how I got to certain greens or certain warmth, certain crops. We can go all the way from the top. I just wanted to have like a good idea of what, what I wanted to do on each of these photos. So something fun too to mention before we totally get started. Um, inside of Lightroom, if you didn't know, you can always access any of these little sections or you can hide them with this little carrot tool. So if you don't want to look at the whole gambit, you can really minimize all of those carrots. <laughs> Nick's back there now too. Um, anything that feels good. So I like to typically leave my presets open. I love leaving my navigator open because that's how you can really move around in a photo easier. I love seeing my histogram not only to see what I really blew out, which is this little triangle on the right, but to see what was too dark, which would be the triangle on the left. It looks like this photo is a little overexposed, so there's not too much, you know, underexposed shadows, but look at how naughty that sky is. What else I really love about histogram is it shows you your settings real quick. So as you edit and as you go through your photos, it's really important to look over at your settings and just take note of some of the challenges that come with certain overexposed images or certain underexposed images. Um, I think in the 12 that I picked here today, I have one that's super overexposed, which we're looking at right now, and one that is like super underexposed. And then I have a few that I think are like properly exposed. So we are kind of all over the map, but just to mention during this content day, I definitely felt very creative and I wanted to try some slow shutter stuff. So you're gonna see some wacky sets. Don't just jot down my sets and then like run and go do that because um, they're not necessarily the right settings. I was getting very experimental. But 
the whole point of being able to see them is you can learn along the way of like, okay, what do I love or what do I loathe when it comes to settings? So for me, I, after this shoot and many others where I've made this mistake, I don't particularly love an ISO of 800 outdoors during daylight hours. It just ruins the highlights in a way that you can't really get back. And we'll look at that a little bit into um, the editing piece of this video. But um, I do really love to like really see what apertures are my favorite. On my 35 millimeter, somewhere between like 2.8 and 3.2 is just absolutely amazing. Just enough of the background and like the foreground and all of the good stuff, like your field of focus is just juicy, uh, juicy enough, but it's not like so aggressive where the background's distracting. See like this photo, it's really nice to be able to see those Sugoros hanging out there up on the hill, but it's also really awesome that your eyes are drawn to them, which is like, they're the cutie subject in the middle. And then of course you can see your shutter speed. So, and as you look at your histogram and you look at your settings, you can kind of deduce, okay, if I could improve this photo, if I could go back, I would either lower my ISO or I would increase my shutter speed. Like right off the bat, I'm like, yep, that would have solved those highlights. So it's cool to look at your histogram. Don't be afraid of that. Um, if you want to actually like shame yourself while you're editing, you can turn on that little triangle in the upper right, but I don't usually do that. I just like hover over it and I'm like, whoop, a lot of red and then I move on. But Alex, he likes to keep it on because it um, is a really good reminder of what you want to make sure you retain in highlights and data. So from the top, make it drop. That's some wet. Just kidding. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pick what preset we want as our base. So before we jump in, I really want to just give my best practice or just my opinion on presets and how you can really use them to up level your business and maintain consistency. Um, the biggest thing to take away is you should never use a preset as a band-aid for not knowing how to manipulate your photos in Lightroom. You need to be able to edit. Um, I don't believe in the like, oh, you just slap a preset and move on. That's not what we're doing here today. But we do use presets as tools, which is what I think they're intended to be, as like a base. So sometimes it's really nice to maintain that consistent editing style. And it's really easy to do if you have presets that you love. So. If you're learning Lightroom, presets can be a really good jump start. But as you'll learn, presets are just simply someone's version of a perfect photo or a perfect edit saved into one little filter, essentially. So don't just run out and go buy Beba presets, Campfire presets, DC presets, unless you really connect to them. And then I would also implore you to try to use them the way that I do as like a tool and a starting point, but never the end all be all. Um, I love all of those women who created those presets, but all of their presets are slightly different than what I would want them to be. So I do make adjustments 110% of the time. Um, and I'll kind of verbally walk you through like some of the areas of development that I feel these presets have, and then you can obviously make your own adjustments. The biggest thing to remember with presets and just editing in general is the whole idea that you never are gonna have the perfect edit. edit. It's just not gonna, it's not real. So one really smart gal once said to me, if you can get to 90% edited and you feel like it's a good edit, you should export at that time because the perfectionist in all of us is gonna wanna come back and tweak and tweak and just keep tweaking um, until the point where maybe it can even get weirder than it was when you were at 90%. So my, my whole take on it is definitely go as hard as you can until 90% and then realize that you did a great job and export your photo. Um, what is it? It's it's better to be done than uh, and messy than to be like never finished and perfect, right? Um, it's progress, not perfection. So that's how I, I handle my my uh, editing. So when I do begin and I have all of those those mindsets in my, um, in the back of my pocket when I'm ready to go, I do roll through some of my favorite presets for certain areas. So in the past, I've worked in um, editing Arizona landscape and it has very unique greens, very unique heat. Um, and so I have a couple that I have set up over here under user presets that I really like. So before I got started today, I really was vibing with going to California, which is a preset that we made um, for uh, Arizona and California. So the greens are pretty similar. And um, I really liked that one. So if I was being lazy and I didn't want you guys to see the full process, I would just start there because I think this is a really good base. But I want to show you how I got to there. So personally, one of the three main preset packs that we rely on for consistency is the Dawn Photo G preset collaboration called 
campfire presets. What I love about these presets is Dawn did in fact create four very unique presets, but then she also created four film versions of those presets. And what that really breaks down to is higher grain, less contrast, more of a like nostalgic kind of vibe, but that's super trendy right now. And it's something that a lot of people really aspire to create. So if that's something you're after, I would recommend the preset pack. To create Going to California, I did start with a base of Dawn Photo 2 film. So I would go over to my preset and I would apply it. Then I would shut that down because now I'm ready to start tweaking this photo. I'm gonna move this over just so that way I have a little more space. Oh, I guess I can. Just kidding. But let's move over to the right. The first major things that I adjust in any photo is the heat um, or the temperature rather. So I think it's really important to kind of get your warmth similar to where you would want it to be when you're all done right away. So that way you don't have to mess a lot with blues or anything crazy that the, the temperature might create organically. The next thing I adjust is my highlights. I almost always bring my highlights as far down as I can. Um, same thing with whites. I think it just sometimes is a little too distracting. So the way I like to edit is I bring those both down. From there, I can notice right away, I feel like this photo needs more contrast. So I'm gonna bring the contrast up. And that would be my one piece of feedback for the Dawn Campfire presets, the film, is that the contrast is just too low for my liking. And then from there, I think my crop is a little off. So I'm just gonna crop it in, just so I can really bring the attention back to them right in the center. Okay. And then from there, I would maybe adjust the exposure a little bit because I do want to impact the exposure of the full photo. And then I can come back and adjust just the actual subject's exposure. So that's looking really good so far. I think next I will go adjust the exposure of the couple. So if you go up here, there's a new tool called masking. And if you haven't used it yet, or if you've clicked on it and you've rolled your eyes because it seems crazy, we're about to break it down. It's very simple. Inside of the masking tool, they compounded your brush tool, your gradient tool, your radial tool, and you basically are just creating kind of like Photoshop. If you've ever worked in Photoshop, you're creating an overlay. So you're creating layers upon layers of edits within a photo, and that's all that masking is. So don't, don't overthink it. Masking is just like one grouping um, of like all of your tools. So what's really new and exciting about adding a mask is you have the access to select a subject or the select the sky. This is wildly impactful if you overexpose the sky like I did, or if your subject is just not aligning with your actual landscape. So here I feel like the landscape is light and bright and beautiful, but I feel like they are very punchy and dark. So what the masking does, and if you select the subject, is it uses an artificial intelligence to detect your subject. And you see that there, it turns red because it's showing you like, yep, this is your subject, right? So over here, you'll notice it's telling you what your mask is. And if you hover over it on your actual people, it'll show you like, yep, we've selected the subject for you. And now when you're inside of this mask and you've clicked on it and the red is illuminated on your subject, you can make adjustments to just your subject, but it's gonna be hard to see how those adjustments are really faring. So I want you to press O on your keyboard, which is the shortcut to just shut down that red overlay, but you are still selected on your mask. But once you've pressed O for that keyboard shortcut, you can then adjust your shadows. I usually bring up my shadows. Um, you can maybe adjust your contrast. I would maybe here, maybe bring the blacks up a little bit just to see what that would look like. Sometimes when someone's wearing all black, it can be super punchy. Um, and I think that's definitely the vibe of the fit. So I'm not trying to like take away from that, but I also don't want it to seem like he has like a dark abyss. Um, that's looking really good. You can, increase the texture or the clarity on anything that you want to have a little extra punch. So I think that the texture tool is a lot easier to work with. Um, you'll notice that it just kind of creates a little bit of extra like punch to it, but be very mindful of the clarity tool. Cause as you will notice here, if you start moving the clarity, do you notice how it kind of like makes them look almost like HDR? I don't know if anyone remembers editing back in the day when there was those online editing websites and you could like do a filter that made people look like they were a cartoon character. Too much clarity kind of reminds me of that. So just be very careful. But sometimes it's really helpful if you slightly miss focus. Funny enough, a lot of these photos were taken with our Mark IV, which we've upgraded and we've since um, eliminated a lot of our old focusing issues because the Mark IV was 
just kind of tricky to to get the right focus all the time and we've upgraded to mirrorless which we're huge advocates for so it was very fun to go back in and edit and just cull inside of the content day where I photographed it with Mark Fours, there were so many focus issues and I could literally do an entire breakdown reel of just how many heartbroken moments I had today culling through, seeing photos that could have been there but just weren't because of the Mark IV focusing issues and my user error of not always having the best autofocus settings. But um, we don't run into that as much at all um, with the R6, so just a little plug for mirrorless. Um, have, let me know in the chat if anybody's upgraded to mirrorless and you're like, yes, this is amazing. Like, I'm so grateful. Um, so now that we've got our subject in a pretty crispy place where we want them to be, I'm actually going to unselect that mask. And now we're back to the full photo. A few things that I always adjust in my photos um, are inside of some of these other carrots. So let me go down to HSL. A really awesome tool that I think everybody and their mother should know about is these little tiny nubby dudes. And I know that's not like the technical term for them. And if anybody knows the technical term, please tell me in the chat box. But I like to call them my little nubby dudes because if you select one and bring it into the photo, you can select a color, isolate a color, and either change the hue, the saturation, or the luminance. So this is super helpful if maybe your preset makes people a little too orange. Or in this photo, I feel like the green in that bush is just so dominating. So there are three different things you can adjust. That's HSL, so hue, saturation, and luminance. But you can also adjust all. I personally like to adjust one out of the three versus all of them at once. Sometimes things get way weird. So I'm going to just try to bring that green down. I'm going to go to the saturation nubby dude. I'm going to grab him, bring him out into the photo. And if you select the color, I want you to watch the slider. All that I'm doing with my mouse is I'm dragging it down. And you'll notice that that green is kind of leaving the photo. But what's sad is it's also taking away some yellow. So I'm going to bring it back just a little bit more. I wanted to bring the, the green down, like just to tone it down. But I didn't want to like, you know, desaturate it to the point where it looks like that. I mean, that's like, that screams Etsy presets 2018. And we're not going for that green. We're going for, hey, there was green here, but it's not distracting you from maybe the rust in his shirt or the beautiful smiles on their faces. So that feels really good. Um, please use that tool sparingly because if you do take one color out, it is going to take that color out of the whole photo. So for blue jeans, sometimes certain blue jeans are really, really saturated in aqua blue when you do go to edit them with certain presets, especially Beba. I've noticed her blues are whack ass. Um, and dude, that's fine. She's from California and I'm, I'm not. So my blues are very different. Um, I love Beba. Don't like take that as like shade or tea, but the blues for blue jeans get really weird with that preset pack. So I use this tool a lot for that. But sometimes if you bring the saturation of a blue out of pants or jean denim, it'll take the blue out of the sky. So just be careful, make adjustments and just play. My biggest thing here today is this is a software where you're meant to play, like experiment, do some funky stuff. And if you don't like it, reverse it. You can always go back. As a fun fact, if you ever do legitimately just want to go back a few steps, you always have over here on the left under the history carrot, I'm going to call it the carrot, you always have access to every step of your edit. The only time you don't is if you sync over your edit to other pictures, it'll only ever save your edit history per photo per like the original photo. So like if you have to go back to your OG photo, if you want to redo something. But um, I personally really like to um, go back to the history if sometimes I went just a few steps too far. So uh, when it comes down to this edit, uh, again, the sky's super blown out, so there's not much that I can do to bring that back. But inside of the masking tool, you can attempt to bring back some definition in the sky. So back up to masking, I would select the sky. This time it's gonna tell me, yep, all this red is the sky. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Press O on your keyboard to remove the red and let's bring down the highlights. So that brings back a little bit of that matte finish, which looks nice. Let's bring down the whites and that brings up, that brings too much matte into it. So I'm gonna bring that back up just a little. And I would say that that's a pretty good place to leave the sky. Some people really like to bring blue back into the sky. So that's where you can bring back the blue temperature, um, that, that coolness in the temp. But personally, I feel like in Arizona, I want more people to be drawn into the greens than I do the blues in the sky. 
So I think one really powerful question I'm always asking myself when I'm in the middle of an edit is what's distracting me from looking right at the subject? Like what's the story I'm trying to tell? And is anything in the photo distracting you from that? That's where you'll kind of get caught up in, okay, should I bring my shadows up because it's too punchy? Or should I bring some more texture back to the land because it's a little too blown out? Just keep asking yourself, what does this photo need? How can I make this the best edit? And then you'll know where to go from there. But beyond the nubby dudes, which I told you about that tool, which I think is really cool, the next thing that I usually always um, adjust is underneath the detail, and it's the sharpening. Um, I love to bring sharpening close to like 30, maybe 40. Um, it just gives it a little extra pizzazz. And then under noise reduction, I really love, <clears throat> excuse me, I really love to have a specific formula for just like a kiss of softness, but also like so much good texture. So this is my code. You can change it however you want, but I think that luminance being at 33, detail being at 20, oops, and contrast being at five is an awesome like just touch of like softness but not too much and we're gonna go and adjust a grain here in a second because you can see here in this little navigator that it's still a little too grainy um but i think that this is just a really good way to to like i said give it like an overall like finishing touch in my mind it's kind of like the clear coat on your nails after you paint them you need that clear coat for it to have that nice finish. So that's what luminance is to me. If you don't know what luminance is, it's literally just a way to soften noise in your photo. So if I zoom in on them, and again, there's still a ton of grain on the photo because that just comes with the preset. So we'll adjust that in a second. But if you watch, if we bring the luminance up, it does make it softer. And then if you bring the luminance down, it makes it punchier in the grain. So the reason I like to keep it at, um, 33 is I think it softens it just enough, but with the sharpening and all of the other contrast things that we've edited, they still have enough punch that you don't lose the definition of your subject. Now, one thing I do adjust 110% of the time is under lens corrections. You almost always need to enable profile corrections, which removes the natural vignetting that comes from your lens when you're shooting, but it will also brighten your photo. So you see now it's even brighter. Um, and also remove chromatic aberration. When you do these two things, like I said, it will make it a little bit brighter. So I like to bring my exposure down at that time. And then if I have to come back and adjust their exposure, that subject again, you can always go back up to your mask. So that made me bring the shadows up. Perfect. So we're still doing pretty good. One thing that's still distracting me is just how dark the subject is, but how light and bright the landscape is. So a really cool tool that I want you to play with, especially in these landscape situations, is I want you to create a mask and create a brush. And then inside of Lightroom, you have this tiny little double carrot thing underneath. Um, it's right next to effect, right above temperature. When you're inside of your brush, which I'm still selected on my brush, if I go over on my picture, I can see that. You, you can go to custom and then there's a carrot up and a carrot down. And there are a few things that are built into your Lightroom and there's so many tools that you can add to this list. But one that I love for bringing back definition to landscape around a subject is called the burn tool or darken. As you look here, it is your shortcut, but it is literally just bringing less exposure to wherever your brush stroke goes. So I like to bring it down to like close to like 60 for this situation and then watch what happens. I can just bring back a little bit of the detail of the landscape around them. And then now that I've made that brush mark, I can press O to see that red to see where my brush mark really um, went. Unselect O and then now you can adjust that exposure even more. So now, I brought back, and maybe we'll start at the top so you guys can really see that. This is where we were, and this is where I wanted it to be. And that's just because I don't want the landscape or my mistake with my settings to distract you from like the cute moment that's happening right in the middle. So again, I'm gonna bring that, those shadows up again, maybe make a quick adjustment to contrast, but this is really starting to look like a good edit, exactly what I would want it to be. Um, I'm gonna go down to the bottom, and I want you guys to look at one more thing that 
if you didn't see our reel yesterday or the day before, you might not know about this. So I want you to know inside of Lightroom, if you ever make a mistake with your actual composition or how you tilt your lens, so to speak, towards or away from the subject, sometimes you can accidentally warp someone's body. So I wanted you to know about the transform tool. The transform tool allows you to warp reality in post-production. So let's say that I accidentally took the photo with my lens too close to their heads. You can kind of tilt it one way or tilt it the other. And then if you didn't want to do a warp of vertical, you can do maybe horizontal where you can switch it from one side or the other. Honestly, there's some really cool stuff that you can do with like the Y axis or the, um, the X axis, but, or offset, yep. What I really wanted to make sure that everybody knew about but is very careful with is the aspect one. You can kind of shrink people or um, kind of like elongate them, but that's just a really weird thing to do. Um, people, they naturally are a shape and you should never disrespect that shape, um, at least how we edit. I don't like to do that. So just be very careful when you start to transform. Sometimes it can help you to undo a mistake, but it can also warp the reality of somebody's body shape or head shape and that can get weird too. But it really can save the day. So I just wanted you guys to know about that tool. Okay, the last thing that I really do use pretty often is underneath the crop tool. If you go to crop and let's say I had messed up my horizon and I really wanted to bring back like a nice straight horizon, there is this little tiny um, angle tool. It looks like a, man, what's those things called? Alex, you know when you're building the van a level, that's what it is. Never mind, Alex. Um, this little tiny guy reminds me of a level. So basically when you do select it, it comes out onto the photo with you. You can select one spot of your horizon and then drag while holding your mouse down to the other part of your horizon. And if this was straight, it would make that adjustment for you. So I could say that this is the kind of photo that I would want to produce. But personally, I think we all remember that this was a mountain that continued to ascend. So I kind of want the horizon to have that, that ascending effect. But this can be really helpful for like wedding venues or um, rooms where there's like maybe some um, shiplap on the walls. You don't really want the, the room to look like it's wonky. So that is an awesome tool located underneath the crop tool. Okay. So that's our first edit. I would say that that's pretty close to what I would want that photo to look like. I'm just gonna pop out and see what we've got going on inside of the demo. Ready for any questions in the chat? Cool, thank you for moderating, Alex, I appreciate. Okay, so the next thing that I would do if I had stuff in that same area with like maybe similar colors is I would press if you have a Mac computer, a lot of my shortcuts are going to be for Mac users. If you do not have a Mac computer, you can always look up the Lightroom shortcuts on Google. Literally just go up to Google and type in, um, what is it? Oops, wrong one. Sorry, I call my husband sexy boy in chats. Um, if you go over to your, yeah, just go over to your Google and just type in Lightroom shortcuts for Windows and Mac. But my shortcut for right now is I want to be able to sync over the majority of my settings so that way I don't have to re-edit all of these photos and they're all within the same area, similar lighting, similar settings. So to save yourself a little bit of time, you'd press command, select the photos that you want to sync it over. You'll notice that it highlights them. Always start on the photo that you're bringing the settings over from. And then over here on the right, you can press sync couple things you will notice is I almost always leave transform, crop, and spot removal and masking unselected because the chances are that in the next photo, the spot that you removed is in a very different place or the crop is going to be different. You know, those are things that are very unique to each photo. So don't bring those things over. You'll save yourself some time. Um, sometimes I've accidentally moved over a spot removal and you've like removed a chunk of somebody's face and it cloned like a tree nearby and you're like, what the heck is going on? And that's what's going on. So press sync and then you're going to see if the colors are going to align or if you're going to have to do some major adjustments. So in here, because I didn't move over the mask, I'm going to still need to select my subject. I'm going to need to bring my shadows up and then maybe make that contrast adjustment. I do think that their colors are a little aggressive, so I'm just going to bring my saturation down just a little bit. And then that's looking pretty good. If you ever want to double check your heat, um, to be consistent with like the first edit that you did. I like to use the shortcut command first select the first photo 
press command, select the second photo, just like we did before, but instead of pressing sync over here, you're gonna press N on your keyboard and it'll bring up a display of both photos or multiple photos. Let's say you selected all 12. That's something that you can do right as you're about to export just to double check that everything's pretty consistent. Nothing's worse than being really happy with all of your individual edits, but then when you put them all together, there's like so much variance that it almost looks weird and unprofessional. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. Um, over here for the third photo in the series, I feel like they are way darker. So we're just going to play a little bit with the exposure. I would say bring up my shadows. A lot of the first few moments with any edit are me just kind of figuring out exposure. And then from there asking myself, okay, what's distracting? Is it color? Is it a certain um, imperfection of the skin that I need to remove? Um, one little side note for anyone who would like to know, I am really excited about this year and this season of editing because we used to do a lot of our removal inside of Lightroom with the cloning tool, which is this little band-aid up here. It works for little things. Like I saw here in this first photo, I have this little tiny rainbow from the lens flare. Um, this came from just the light hitting a certain scratch on my lens. So you can use the clone tool, which is the band-aid to remove little things. And you won't be able to tell, like anyone who comes across this photo, they're never gonna know that I used the cloning tool but sometimes the cloning tool is imperfect and it'll make photos look weird. So I am really excited to be incorporating more of Photoshop in my process of editing. If I notice that there's something in a photo that I do not have the ability to remove smoothly and fast with the cloning tool, I'm going to mark it as a different color, export it into a separate Photoshop folder and just go edit that in Photoshop because the tools inside of Photoshop to remove items is so much more intuitive than the cloning tool. You'll save yourself a ton of time and it'll just look like an overall better edit because the cloning tool can really mess some stuff up. So if anybody wants a, a tutorial on that, maybe that'll be our next happy hour. But I think it's gonna save us a lot of time. We've been practicing with it and it's been awesome so far. So for this photo specifically, I really like the colors of the background around them. So I'm gonna press my masking tool again Go to select subject. It's going to take a second to detect the subject. And then from there, I'm going to press O on my keyboard so I can remove the red. I'm going to bring up the shadows, maybe increase the contrast just a little bit. I'm closer to them so it looks like it's got a good contrast. Something really fun that you can play with inside of Lightroom is called Dehaze. In this photo, there is light. There's some beautiful sunlight in the upper left hand corner. And I feel like maybe sometimes sunlight can make a photo look a little bit hazy, especially in the next one, which we'll play with. Um, but you can adjust that dehaze with this tool. So maybe you wanna make them a little bit punchier, or darker, you can bring it up. If you wanna maybe remove some of the haze, you can bring it down. Um, I like to mess around with that too, because because I think it's a really nice way to bring back some, um, some texture to a subject that maybe light has kind of hazed over. Yeah, okay, so that's looking really good. Um, another fun adjustment I might make to this, and I should have made in the first photo, so I do apologize, is underneath effects, you're going to want to always, almost always adjust your grain. A lot of these presets, it is very trendy to add obnoxious grain, and you never really want to take too much quality away from your photos. So I usually like to keep my grain close to like five to, to 10. Um, and you can adjust the size, you can adjust the roughness. I just really like to bring it down a little bit so it does have that you know beautiful matte finish but it's not taking away the quality of like their skin so if you come closer this is what the grain was at with the preset and then this is what the grain is that i really like just enough not too much so inside of the mark four i do notice that there's their subject this beautiful intimate moment of their noses touching their smiles out i feel like i could make that just a little bit punchier and what i can do to like make it more focused or just more defi defined is go up to masking, create a brush, and then I'm going to just bring either the contrast up, well, not or, and the texture up. And then I can just bring a little bit of definition to the darkness in their eyelashes or their eyebrows or like the definition in their lips and their teeth, the little tiny crinkles by their eyes. Like just by bringing a little definition back to those things, it will give the photo this overall effect of, okay, it was more focused on them. So then I can zoom out and now it looks like I caught focus so much better than I actually did. This is a great tool to use if you just want to add a little extra punch to something. But again, you can't ever bring focus back to something that you just did not catch focus on. Okay, so that's looking really good. I want to jump over to this photo 
and talk about dehaze because I think this is a great example of what haze could look like. Now I'm going to sync over my settings, but I am in a very different spot. So they might look a little weird right away. And yep, they do, but not too crazy. I'm going to first bring up my exposure and I'm noticing that I am just losing so much definition to that haze from that direct light. So this is just a learning lesson for me. I shouldn't have shot with the light directly behind them like that. I should have moved to the side or the other side to maybe get that kiss of light, that halo of light around his head and her head, but not necessarily having that light mess with my lens to the point where it's hazing them, creating these light leaks. And sometimes those can end up on people's faces and then you can actually lose a photo, which is really sad, um, especially if it ends up on somebody's eyeball. That's the saddest story. But underneath dehaze, you can bring back overall dehaze of the photo. Um, but what I really like to do is select the subject. I just love that masking tool. You guys should really play with it more often. It's fun. Bring up the shadows, bring up the contrast, and then dehaze just to skosh. Um, Alex's mom loves to cook, and when she's putting all of her ingredients in the mixing bowl, it's never like actual measurements. It's always like a pinch or a dash or a skosh. I don't know what the measurement for skosh is, but it's something. So whatever a skosh is to you, give it a skosh. And then from there, I'm really feeling like this is maybe just one of those photos where it's overall going to have that hazy look. So when you put it next to these four, once again, I select it all, and then I uh, press N, it's gonna have a different vibe, but it is a hazy photo. The direct light creates a different effect. It could still be valuable to the customer. It could still be valuable to my portfolio. I'm not gonna edit any more of that out because otherwise I'll just make it look weird. Because in this photo, that light is now gone and it's more about the subject. Okay, so before we go any further, I just want to say I can keep syncing over my edits but I want to talk a little bit about black and white. So let's make this one black and white. Um, there are a couple of different presets that I really like, and you just have to kind of ask yourself what, basically, what level of contrast do you really want and how aggressive do you want your whites to be? All black and whites are kind of um, wrapped around those two questions. So the other two preset packs that we really love are Don Charles, pack one. Shout out to any OGs out there who invested in that. That was the best first wedding preset that we ever invested in. Um, I've since moved far, far away from it. I usually only use the, her uh, presets for indoor reception stuff just because I feel like it's lacking some heat. I need heat. Um, but I love her black and whites. Her black and whites are so timeless and so beautiful. Um, I love that in BW1, I can bring the shadows up and almost have like a perfect black and white edit in my mind. I do like to bring the highlights down just a little bit, but that's just my preference. And literally right there, I'm like, yep, that's a, that's a bomb edit. Love that black and white. Just to show you the difference, I am going to select the first photo, right click on it, create a virtual copy, and then I'm going to reset this next photo. And I do this sometimes when I'm playing around with picking a preset. If I'm just torn between a few, I'll make create I'll create virtual copies of the one photo I'm really trying to nail down the colors on, and then I'll run through a couple of different edits and then figure out which one I like the most. It's all about perspective. Campfire presets. I love Dawn's campfire presets. Again, you get that really vintage, nostalgic kind of look. Once again, I'm gonna bring up my shadows. I'm gonna bring up my exposure a little bit. What, I'll note, what you'll notice about um, Dawn Campfire presets compared to Dawn's is that she has um, more of a like warmth to the black and white, which I think is really awesome. Um, if you just look at the two right next to each other, you can see it pretty clear that this one seems more blue. So I do gravitate more towards um, Dawn Campfire uh, black and white, but they're really, really grainy. So I want you to come down immediately and you don't need 40 grain, bring it down just a bit and then that's much closer to what I would like for a black and white. But to show you one other black and white and why it's so cool to have a few different preset packs that you really align with, you get to kind of see what they all do differently and what they all do really well at. So Beba, Beba went hard in the paint when it came to the black and whites. So like her BW9 is this, which is wonderful, but it is so dang punchy. So I'll bring the highlights down and the whites down just so you can kind of get a grip. But the contrast is up 60. Over here, we're only up 20. Over here, we're only, we're up 25. So whenever you're looking at all of your different things, definitely look at your numbers, because that's all a preset is, is just everybody's different version of an edit. But let's look at all three of these side by side. So um, 
figure out a black and white that you really like and try to stay consistent to it. Because if I have uh, my feed set up or just my galleries in general, if, if people see a lot of this kind of a black and white punchy edit, they are expecting that. And if I deliver this, which might be what I like the most, they're going to be like, well, what the heck? I was expecting that. Um, I don't think anybody's ever called us out on it, but we've definitely edited galleries with this and then we were like, whoa, that's actually kind of crazy. So learn from my mistake, pick one that you align with and just kind of stick with it. So when I look at it in this view, I really like this one, um, but I do think I want to add some more contrast or at least bring the blacks back down. I don't want it to look so washed out or lacking definition. So I brought my contrast up, brought my blacks down, and I feel like that looks really good. So I'm going to press N one more time. And yeah, that's, that's, that's the vibe. I'm into it. Cool. So yeah, a couple of fun tips there. Um, one really cool shortcut, if you wanted to make multiple black and whites, multiple create a virtual copy throughout your gallery. So let's say maybe one of the benefits of your business model is that you offer one black and white for every color image you edit. We did that in the beginning of our business and I think people really liked it. We have since moved to this very fun creative space where we just pick which ones we wanna make a black and white. Um, not every photo looks good in black and white. And honestly, sometimes you, you would prefer a photo to be black and white than in color for a number of reasons. So we don't do this now, but maybe you want to. This nonetheless is a very cool shortcut. You can select with the command shortcut. So select the first photo, press command, select the second photo, select another photo, go throughout your whole gallery. Maybe this is the last step you do before you export. And now that you have those four photos selected, right click on one of them, create virtual copies. And now it's going to have your four new copies selected. Don't move off of this. I want you to go right to whatever your black and white campfire preset is gonna be. So let's say it's Dawn. Make your adjustments real quick, whatever you would normally do on that one photo. So I'm gonna bring my blacks down, my contrast up. I'm gonna go all the way down to grain, bring it down. And once my black and white's similar to what I want the rest of them to have, do not click off of this, just go to sync. And then now you're going to, I wanna make sure that grain is selected, but you're gonna synchronize that black and white throughout this. And then now the shortcut is you can just press the arrow key on your keyboard and with your mouse in your right hand, you can just quickly adjust your exposure or your shadows most times. And then you've done your black and white edits. That saves me a ton of time. Um, obviously in this situation, I would have removed some of those distracting skin imperfections and maybe smoothed his beard rubble or whatever you want to call that his rough his roughness um before i made the black and white so i don't have to redo that but just for the sake of example i'm just going to show you that i'm just exposing um properly and then moving on and then i've done my black and white edits black and white edits are definitely a fun thing to add into your galleries if you don't already do them um, people really enjoy being able to have a little bit of everything so yeah, that's my little shortcut for black and whites. Create a virtual copy, sync everything over, have a good day. Okay, trying to think of what other fun tools you guys need to be successful. We've really gone over a lot of good stuff. I've talked about how cloning inside of Lightroom is inferior to just editing things out inside of Photoshop. We talked about adjusting grain, luminance. We've talked about the nubbies for hue, saturation, and luminance. We've talked about masking tool, which I think is amazing. Um, one little tiny tool that you could use for um, certain scenarios and like receptions and stuff is you can remove red eye. I don't have any red eye stuff in here because I wasn't using flash. Um, bum, 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 bum. One really cool tool if you don't like to use presets and you want to try to figure out the, um, the actual heat of your photo, you want to make sure your whites are always um, properly balanced. You can use this little dropper tool to select white in the photo. So you can either do white in the sky or you can do white in your shirt. And once you press select, it will, okay, cool. So there was no data because I blew out the sky. Let's see what our ISO is. Yeah, look at that. Even at 320, still too bright. Um, but anyways, you can go to whatever white is in the photo. So I would go with either his shoelace or her shirt, but let's just go with her shirt. This is what Lightroom thinks a properly um, heated <laughs> photo is for whites. So that's a little different than what I would do. Um, but sometimes that's a really helpful tool for reception photos. You can set your white balance in post if you maybe didn't have it set to auto white balance or maybe you had your Kelvin all wacky or maybe you ran into a new area with new warm cam lights and you just need the orange to go away so you can get into your edit. Okay, 
So one really fun tip that I want to give you guys. Hold on. What time is it? Cool. We're down to our last 11 minutes. I want to leave five at the end for any open Q and a, um, but one really cool tool that I wanted to show you guys just to expand on a reel that we offered yesterday, you can at any time adjust someone else's preset and then make it completely your own and create your own preset. This can be really helpful for if you are making aggressive adjustments to presets and it's just taking so much time to take a base into what you want it to be. You can create what's called a user preset inside of Lightroom. So, and that's what I did because this green is very different than I think Dawn or Beba or the other Dawn had thought that I would be working with. And that's fine, that's the way that it works. Um, let's say I started with a base of Dawn Photo 2 and I make all of my adjustments. I bring the shadows up, highlights down, contrast up. I can adjust my texture. Maybe I go down and make those adjustments to detail and put that into my preset. So sharpening up to like 33, my luminance up to 33. Let's go 20 on the detail, five on the contrast. Let's scroll just a little bit. Lens corrections, I wanna put into my preset that lens correction so I don't have to adjust it every time. Um, I'm gonna bring my grain down. Do all of your normal adjustments. Get it pretty close to where you would want your general starting point to be in the future. And then, now this is my preset. I've made my own preset and I'm going to come over here to this plus sign. If you press the plus sign, it will ask you if you want to create a preset. This is also where you import your presets. So you're probably familiar with that. Go to create a preset, and then now you can name it whatever you want to name it. So let's say this one is um, driving through West Virginia. Hope someone caught that reference. Um, and it'll ask you what you want to bring over. So I want to bring over my grain. I want to bring over my calibration. I don't really want to bring over my transformation, but everything else looks really good. Press create. And then you'll notice that it pops up over here. And now when I go to my next photo in this series, I can go to driving through West Virginia and I can boom, start right at my preset and make my adjustments. So what else is really cool is if you hover over that preset and you right click on it, that's how you can export a preset into an XMP file, put it into a zip file and sell it as a digital product. Alex and I have not started selling our own presets yet, mostly because I need to get my naming conventions down. Um, but because we are really enjoying this chapter of life where we are just really having some fun supporting Beba, Dawn, and then Dawn Charles. I love recommending their presets. If we're being completely honest, their presets, especially Beba last year, helped us to really define our creative style because they gave us a really good base to jump from. It just, I'm, I'm a huge fan of their work. And I haven't made anything that I feel is so unique to us yet that we could make money off of it. But that's just my limiting belief and I'm working on that. Um, I wanted to go over here and I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the actual preset profile. So whenever you add a preset, so here I added the campfire profile too. Over here, you're gonna see that it shows you the profile and you can add more or less of that. Um, this is mostly, it looks like around like color, but. I think that it's a really cool thing to adjust if you have any like micro adjustments that you want to make to her current preset. Um, just another little tiny adjustment you can make in Lightroom. One really important thing to recognize in Lightroom or any of these softwares is there is so many different ways to do the same thing. What I mean by that is like you can adjust your contrast to bring back definition in a photo, but you can also adjust your texture, your clarity. You could bring down your blacks. So there's no one, one fix all be all type of edit um, or like tool. There's there's just so much that you can do inside the program. What I wanted to do today is empower you to learn a little bit and then take little pieces from what I've shown you and bring those into your own edits. You're gonna find different things that I didn't even cover today that are going to be really cool. Um, and as we continue and expand these editing Lightroom happy hours, I hope that we can offer some more micro adjustments, more micro tools, some really cool like save the day type elements of this program that we just didn't get today to today. And that's fine because I want you guys to to take it incrementally. It can feel like a lot and I do move really fast and I talk really fast and I'm working on that. But I think that today we really were able to kind of get a good base and now you can take little tiny things and apply those to your edits right now. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions. We do have about five minutes left. So I'm gonna shut down Lightroom and I'm gonna go back over to Demio and I'm going to see if there's anything crazy that we need to answer. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just for a second. Okay, 
Abby said, in Lightroom, there's a little I button by each tool to see how each edit looked before you made the adjustment. Can you do that in Classic Tool? So what you can do inside of Classic, let me go share my screen again. Um, it's not an I, but you can do like your before and after, and it's a little keyboard shortcut. So um, I love being able to do that without creating a virtual copy because it's kind of cool to see like the before and after. So on the keyboard for the Mac, it's right next to... Oop, wrong one. It's right above the return key. If you press that, you'll see up in the right hand corner, there's before. And then if you press it again, it'll bring back your edit. Another way to kind of compare edits instead of pressing N, which was the original shortcut I showed you, you can um, press C. So if you select on one photo and press C, it'll immediately bring up the next photo in line so you can compare them. So this I think was meant be, to be for when you're culling inside of Lightroom, but I also think it's really helpful if maybe you didn't fully cull down your gallery and you really just wanna see side by side two of your photos that are probably pretty similar. So I could use this for my, like my black and white. And then to get out of that, so this is an example of that compare, you just press C again to get out of that. So then Abby, just to double check, was that what you were talking about that like before and after kind of thing, or are you thinking about something different? And again, it's the little tiny, it's like a sideways backslash right above the return key on a Mac. Oh, nice. It actually showed me what my base was too. That's cool. Let me go back to Demio and see what you say. Oh no. I meant for each individual edit you make, not the overall edit. Okay, so no, um, Lightroom doesn't have that, but what they do have underneath the develop tab is you have this, which is your like history. And if you notice in the navigator, it shows you all of those different adjustments as you made them. So you can kind of follow along, but you're right. It doesn't actually show you on the big one, but you can go back. So let's say I wanted to see the former edit. You would just click down this list of your history and then you can always go back to the very top. So that's the only way that I know that I would be able to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I hope that helps. So Abby, are you currently using Lightroom desktop, just like the regular one? And you're like considering moving over to Classic? Switched to classic. What do you think so far? Did the original Lightroom have that masking feature? Are you excited about that? And if you, masking is great. Awesome. I'm happy to hear that. So do you have any specific questions? Um, otherwise, I will wrap this up and then make sure that if anybody does have questions, they can always send us a DM or anything in Instagram, and then we can kind of incorporate more of those elements or questions into our next Lightroom happy hour. What did you think, Abby? Was it helpful? Super helpful, never used the detail tab before, but will now, awesome, I'm happy. I actually learned about the luminance piece on TikTok. There was a really nice young gal who was talking about um, just like making that final, those final touches on your photo. And it's really changed the game for the photos. It Sometimes you can add too much texture or too much punch. And so it really does. I like the analogy of the um, clear coat on your nails. I just did my nails yesterday. So that was right off the dome that made me smile. I appreciate you going through your process. I've never learned so much and I think I found the bomb. I think you found the bomb lighting. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Okay, so you guys, I am gonna wrap this up. And um, if you would love to take a screenshot of you on the happy hour and add it to your story on Instagram and just tag us on Instagram, tell us what you thought, if it was helpful, if you, um, if you wanna learn anything next time, like just let us know. We've had so much fun and this is just a treasure to do. And we look forward to doing more of these in the future. But uh, yeah, that's it for today. Have a wonderful day and good luck with all of your editing. Okay, and...